any time a person starts to talk about the end of the world, there is this tendency for us to think they probably are on the lunatic fringe. Having said that, we're going to talk about the end of the world. <laughs> but we're going to try to stay away from that lunatic fringe because we're really not uh, interested in that which is spectacular, that which is uh, newsworthy, or that which is going to grab headlines. We're really interested in just listening to what the Bible has to tell us. Because we know that what the Bible tells us about the end is told us so that we might grow, so that we might develop, so that we might have the strength that we need to endure this life. Now last week we kind of began Peter's uh, wrap up of his letter and also his discussion of the end times. And if you remember, Jesus, uh, Peter took on the, uh, the cynics and the scoffers and said to them that part of the problem that they have is that they don't really understand. They don't understand that this delay that seems to have happened really is not about God being unable to do anything. God can break the end of the world with just a word. All he has to say is it's time. Boom. Things are done. He mentioned to us that we need to understand that God is transcendent, which means that God is above and beyond our world. That for him, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. God is outside of time. We can't constrict him to a God made time. He is not subject to it. And then third, he reminded us that when we look at God's delay, we need to see this as God showing mercy to us, that he's giving us an opportunity to repent and come to him. Now he picks up from there in our text this morning with verse 10. And listen to what he says. The day of the Lord, which is generally a statement, anytime you read in the Bible, the day of the Lord means the end of things, the day of judgment. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now, we're told two things here. Number one, that this will be unexpected. He says it will be like a thief in the night. And the illustration that the Bible uses over and over again is that we can't we may know that a fire may happen to our house. We may know that tornadoes come. We may understand that you could get mugged walking down the street. We don't really expect it. If it happens to us, it surprises us. Nobody expects to get mugged because if you expected to get mugged, you would prepare for it. And the Bible talks about it being like the days of Noah, that as Noah was building the ark, everybody knew that it's possible that this Noah guy could be right, but nobody really expected that the flood would come. And when it finally came, it took them by surprise. And the Bible tells us that this is what's going to happen in the end, that we're going to be surprised. We're going to be unprepared. Most people are going to be unprepared. Hopefully, we will be prepared. So the first thing he tells us is that it's going to be a surprise, which reminds us again of the verses in the Bible that tell us that no man knows the day or the hour. And the people who sound like they will not be surprised because they know exactly what it's going to happen are not following the biblical teaching. Now the next thing he tells us is that it will be devastating. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now this is not unusual. Let me read to you some of the verses in the Bible that say the same thing. Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Isaiah said, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. Joel says the sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shining. Micah says the mountains will melt beneath him and the valleys will split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. Now the question that we ask ourselves, and I think it's a fair question, is the Bible talking literally or figuratively? Is the world really going to dissolve? Are the stars really going to fall? Is the sun really going to stop shining? Well, it's certainly possible. God put it all in place and God can shut it all down. But it's also possible that it could be figurative. 
And figurative is when you uh, describe how something feels, that it's going to feel like the world is coming apart. It's going to feel like the sun isn't shining anymore. It's going to feel like the world is collapsing upon us. We use figurative talk all the time, don't we? We say, oh, I didn't sleep all night. Well, what we really mean is that we had a fitful night's sleep. We don't really literally mean that we didn't sleep all night. I hope that's not what it meant. And for those of you who literally didn't sleep all night, you're probably asleep anyhow, so you're not paying attention. <laughs> we say, the fog was so thick that I could cut it with a knife. Now, you can't really go out there with a knife and cut the fog. It just means that it's really, really thick. Or sometimes you'll say to a little kid, oh, you're just, you're just a little monkey, aren't you? Now, we're not really making an evolutionary statement there, you know, that, that you're derived from monkeys. That's really not what we're saying. We're just really saying in a figurative sense that this is an active child, and they like to climb on things. We're not saying they literally are a monkey. So figurative language is not lying. It's just a form of speech. Now, I guess in my mind, it doesn't matter whether it's literal or figurative. Because the point is still there, that what's going to happen is going to be devastating. Now, the end of verse 10 is somewhat uh, confusing. It says, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. That's what the NIV says. The ESV, English Standard Version, which tends to be a more literal translation, writes, and the earth and the works done on it will be exposed. So one says the earth is going to be flattened, but the other says what's going to happen is that God is going to uh, expose everything, going to lay bare not only the earth, but also our hearts and our lives so that there will be nowhere to hide. <coughs> That's probably more devastating than thinking of the world being destroyed, isn't it? The idea of standing before God with no place to hide, no excuse, no rationalizations. Nothing. Now, there's going to be different responses to this, we learn from this text. Some people are going to be terrified. And uh, remember back in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he sees the Lord with a big train that's figurative, but he sees the, the awesomeness of God. And Isaiah doesn't say, ooh, cool. That's not what he says. He says, woe is me, for I am undone. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he fell apart. He had nothing to offer. He understood how small he was. And so the day of judgment is going to be horrible, but it's also going to be a devastating time. It's going to be a terrifying time for people who aren't ready. I mean, think about some of the things that's going to happen. All our secret sin, all of it is going to be exposed. All our pious excuses and our rationalizations, all the things that we have used to make us feel better in this world are going to be taken away. They're going to be shown for what they are. Empty words. All our half-truths will be seen as the lies that they really are. All our distractions, all the things that have amused us, all the things that have pulled us in different directions, will be seen as the idolatry that it really is of pulling us away from the Lord of life. And our self-absorption and our indifference to other people. You know, we don't really see people. We don't care about people. All of that's going to be exposed as a lack of mercy and compassion and love. You can see why that would be terrifying, can't you? The Lord is giving us a, a, a warning here, and it's a reminder that we need to prepare for this day. We prepare for all kinds of things. We, we buy insurance to prepare for fires. We, we buy life insurance in order to prepare for our death, in order to take care of our kids. We buy insurance for our car. We do all kinds of things. We set up our IRAs. We, we do things to prepare for what we know is coming. What are you doing to prepare for this? What are you doing to prepare for the day of judgment when you stand before the Lord of life? One of the things that we need to do is we need to tell other people. The notion that we love somebody 
is denied, negated, if we do not tell them about that which can save them for eternity. I mean, please get that through your head. You say, well, I really love this person. I would never want to compromise our relationship by talking to them about Jesus. If you're not willing to talk to them about Jesus, you don't really have a relationship. You don't really love that person at all because if you know that they're headed towards hell and you say nothing, you can't possibly care about them. We've said it before and we say it again, but we prepare our kids for all kinds of things. We prepare, we teach them how to take care of themselves, we teach them about hygiene, we teach them about eating correctly, we teach them how to uh, play certain sports, we teach them how to um, date, we say this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do, we teach them how to play musical instruments, we do all kinds of things, we teach them how to drive, ride their bike, all kinds of stuff. Are you teaching your kids about Jesus? Are you preparing them for that? See, what's, what's happening in our society is we're, we're racing around with our families doing all kinds of things. You know what's going to happen? We are going to have the most polite and well-mannered children in hell. Think about it. Think about how important this is. You know, Peter's giving us these things because he really wants us to pay attention. Remember the story? The story is told about Pearl Harbor that actually 50 minutes out, the radar guy saw some blips on the screen. And he said to his supervisor, there's something on the screen. And the supervisor said, well, I think it's probably just pigeons that have metal bands around their feet. And as a result of that, eight battleships, three light cruisers, 220 planes were destroyed and damaged, and 2,300 men were killed because they did not heed the warning. Peter is giving us a warning. He's saying, don't pass this off as just a blip on the screen. This is real. This is serious. So, one of the responses is to be terrified a little bit. But there's also a reason for us to rejoice. Look at verse 13. He says, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Now, why are we looking forward to it? Well, we're looking forward to it because that will be the time when the world will be cleansed and fully removed from any sin. Sin will be finally taken out. Pollution, all that stuff, meanness, uh, people who are bullies, all that stuff is going to be taken out. Aches, pains, gone. The devil and his army will be cast into the pit of hell. No more will we have these whispers in our head calling us to do evil things. We will be reunited with our loved ones who have died in the Lord. We will see them again. We will get to meet and worship the Son of God in person. And we will receive our resurrected bodies. Why won't that be nice? The, the bodies that no longer we have to worry about, that no longer age, that you never, you don't have to look at old pictures and say, oh my gosh, what happened to me? Or what was I thinking? You know, sometimes when we look at those old pictures and see what we were wearing, really, I thought that was cool. None of that's going to happen anymore. The reason that we look forward to the day is because we're prepared. We rejoice because we know what is coming. That will be the day of our redemption. It's something to look forward to, but only if we are prepared. It's going to be uh, the, the, the day of the Lord for those who truly trust Him. It's going to be more exciting than, than Christmas morning is for a child. Remember those days, you know, magical days you look forward to, it. oh, I can't believe Christmas is almost here. And, and we had this anticipation or, or that day when your new baby is put in your arms and you say, life doesn't get better than this. It does. It does. Or that wedding day when you stand up on a platform like this and you say, I'm finally marrying forever the person that I love. Those days are great, but they're nothing compared to what is to come for those who have faith in Christ. So the challenge is for us to be people who put our trust in him. Now, Peter asked the question that probably we should ask too, verses 11 and 12. 
Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you ought we to be? And then he tells us, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens and their fruit. Now, the first thing he tells us is that we are to pursue holiness and godliness. But we need to figure out what those words mean. Holiness is a set of partners. It means to be devoted to God. It means to be at his disposal. It means to be at his availability. It means to be serving him above everything else. To be holy means to be in his service, kind of like a military person. Think about it. If, they, if you get orders that you're supposed to report someplace, that's where you go. That's what you do when you're in the military. A holy person is one who is set apart in that sense. Godliness is a person who reflects God's character in the way that they live. That when people look at us, they can say, wow, that person must be a Christian because I see Jesus in them. Listen to what uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, verse uh, 29, What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Now, that doesn't mean that you go out and party. That's not what it's saying. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I think probably you may be a little bit like me. And that I find that that I'm not living to be holy and, and godly. I'm, I'm trying to live up to the least common denominator. I, I want to be as good or a little bit better than the people around me. I want to play up to the level of my competition. But this is calling us to something much higher. This is calling us to live in a way that says, I don't care what other people are doing. I need to live for the Lord. I need to be holy and blameless in His sight. I need to be a person who is doing everything that I can to serve Him. Let's take a little exercise here. I know you don't like that. This is an exercise. You know me well enough to know that this is an exercise that actually involves sweat. Um, but, but let's imagine that we're standing in the Day of Judgment. We're, we're standing outside the courtroom in all imagination. You're standing outside the courtroom and, and you're anticipating standing before the judge all year. Here's some questions to ask yourself. What is it at that moment that you're going to want to hide or erase from your record before you have to give an account for the Lord? What will you wish that you have done and not put off? What, who will you wish you had told about the Lord Jesus? And finally, which of your favorite excuses are going to crumble at that point? Which of your rationalizations are going to seem as nothing? As we stand before the Lord, we are reminded that he calls us to be holy and godly. But he also tells us in verse 14, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. Old Testament sacrifices were to be blameless, whole, spotless. If your animal had a blemish, it was not worthy of giving to the Lord. And yet, we have a tendency to feel that we can give God our leftovers, that we can give God what we have left after we've done everything else. What well, I, I got a couple bucks left. I got a couple minutes left. I've got a little bit left in my heart. I, before I fall asleep, I'm going to mutter a couple of words to you. And we somehow feel that God should be grateful that we found something to give to him. He has always called us to be pure, to be spotless, to be people who want to give him our best. Hmm. In the Marines, they have a great saying, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. The more you sweat in training, the less you bleed 
in battle. For us, the harder we, we seek to follow him now, the more uh, we work at our relationship with God, the more we seek to live in his intimacy and his power, the more we do that, the less damage the world can do to us, the less it can hurt us. He tells us that we should live in, in peace. We say, oh, I'd give anything if I could live with a sense of peace. You can. The Bible says that when we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. So if we want to know peace, the first thing we need to do is we need to have a right relationship with God. We need to come to him and, and, and get rid of the excuses, get rid of the rationalizations, and finally be honest and say, Lord, you know me. You know the struggles of my heart. You know how difficult it is for me to follow you. And as much as I try, I know I can never be the person you want me to be. But I know you're not asking me to be perfect. You're not asking me to, to do anything. You're just asking me to run to you. And so I run to you and I ask you to help me. And I ask you to change my life and my heart. And I ask you to cleanse me through the blood of Jesus. Peace comes when we begin to focus on what God has done for us rather than focusing on what we can do for God. Not that we shouldn't be seeking to serve Him, but we should be seeking out of love, not out of a desire to buy, buy His favor or negotiate with Him. We serve Him because of what He has done for us, not in order to get Him to do things. We find peace as we learn to rest in His wisdom and His guidance through the course of our life. <coughs> We find peace as we start reading the Bible and we start saying, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I trust the character of God. I trust Him. I'm going to rest in Him. And I'm going to do what He says. Not always because it makes sense, but I'm going to do it because of the one who's speaking. You know, I'm always impressed with those people who serve in the military because uh, they go to war, they go without sleep, they go without provisions, they serve in horrible places, they keep going even in horrible spots. And the reason they do that is because they believe in the cause for which they are fighting. They believe that they are doing something positive. And even when they don't understand, you know, people who were in Vietnam and some of those other places, they say, I don't even know why we're here. Doesn't matter to the person in the military. Not to a true soldier. They're here because they trust those who are their commanding officers. They trust that somehow, in some way, when it's all said and done, they will have accomplished a purpose that is much greater than anything that they can see. That's what we're supposed to do. The spiritual battle is being fought every day of our lives. There's coming a day when this world as we know it will come to a close. But that's not the end of the story. So we fight and we struggle because we trust the one who commands the army. Isn't it interesting that Peter doesn't spend a lot of time talking about signs and charts and all the stuff that you, you go to prophecy conferences and stuff and everybody's interested in giving you all the pieces to the puzzle. Here's what we should do. You've got to put these things together. Peter doesn't do that. Peter instead asks us a very simple question. We know that he is coming because he said so. And in light of that, how should we live? So I want to challenge you to think about these things. Ask that hard question. What if today is the day he gives the command? Remind yourself that he said it would be sudden and unexpected. We'll have a tendency to say, well, it won't be today because be careful be careful. He warned us. Instead of putting such thoughts off to the end of your life, think about it now. For some of you, you've been putting off having a real relationship with Jesus because you say you want to have some more fun first. I don't want to get nailed down by this Christianity. I just want to have a good time. Quite frankly, you are engaging in a delusion. Sin is pleasant for a season, but holiness, contentment, joy, and peace are eternal. Have you seen that commercial? Um, it's, it's on some of the ball games. It's for, uh, I don't know, some financial investment firm or something. I don't even 
it must not be a very good commercial. I don't know who it's advertising for. But it's a picture of a dad coming out of his house and he's standing on the front porch and his son walks up to him. He's got this gigantic popsicle that looks like a, a rocket. And he's got it all over his face. And his dad says, where's your new bike? And the kid said, I traded it. And dad says, for what? And the little kid looks at the popsicle, looks up at his dad. And at just that moment, his dad sees a little advertisement for the importance of training your kids in financial matters. And he calls his wife and says, honey, because <laughs> that kid's traded his bicycle for a popsicle. Do you understand that that's what some of you might be doing? You might be a person who is uh, trading the riches of heaven for a handful of sand. You're waiting, thinking, oh, someday I'll get serious with God. But what you're doing is you're squandering your life in the blessing that God wants to give us. You know, most everybody who dies looks back on their life and wishing that they had lived a little bit better. You know, the only way to avoid that is to change now. For those of us who have trusted Christ for forgiveness, this passage reminds us to keep giving up. <coughs> Don't give up. Don't slack. We are fighting a battle that's going to result in a victory that brings freedom to millions and millions of people through the forgiveness of sin. It is a battle that is worth fighting. So, hang in there. Following Christ is not like the amusements of our life. You know, we run after things, we enjoy them for a while, and we move on to something else because we're bored. Following Christ is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And we have to train, we have to work hard, we need to pace ourselves and keep going. So our challenge today is to confront ourselves with the truth. For some of you, it may be the truth of saying, I need to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. I need to stop thinking around. I need to stop playing with this. I need to be serious. I need to be prepared for that which is to come because I don't want to be among those who are terrified. I want to be among those who long for that day of his coming. For others of us, we need to look at our lives and we need to say, okay, I've got to stop giving God a half-hearted effort. He has called me to be holy and blameless, blameless in his sight. Instead of giving him my leftovers, I want to give him the best that I have. I want to be a good soldier in his army. And for those who are weary, we keep fighting on, trusting that the battle is worth the sacrifice. There's going to be tough times coming ahead. I don't know when. But what I know is this, that though some people will be terrified, if we are in Christ, we will not be terrified, but we will be rejoicing. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are very much aware of the fact that we just don't seem to grasp this whole thing. And we know that because of the way that we live our lives. We know that if we really believe this, we would live differently than we do. So help us to really believe it. Help us to listen carefully to what you've told us and to make the appropriate adjustments. Father, for those who don't know you, I pray that this day, this moment, you would lead them to a point of faith. That you would help them to cry out to you and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Cleanse me from my sin. Turn me in a new direction. Help me to overcome that which has me enslaved. Make me new as only you can. For the rest of us, help us to take a most, more sober look at what it means to be your follower. Not that we have to earn your favor because you've given it to us freely, but grant that as recipients of your grace, we might live as those who are looking forward to a better day. So help us to that end. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're to conclude this morning by...